This episode is brought to you by Progressive, where drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average. Quote now at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. And before we run this Sunday's episode, I have a couple quick thoughts and updates that I want to share with all of you. First off, we'll talk about this a lot more over the coming weeks, but we just announced our first ever live show in Boston on Friday, September 13th. It is at the WBUR live event space. Nikki, Kelly, and I will be there along with some special guests. There's a link in the show notes to snag your tickets right now. Please spread the word to anyone in the Boston area, September 13th, the first ever live show for this podcast. We are very, very excited. Anyway, today's episode. So as I'm recording this, the big political story of the moment is who Kamala Harris will select as her vice presidential running mate. It's slated to happen any day now, maybe by the time you're listening to this. And somehow during this very unprecedented election cycle, after Biden stepped aside and Harris became the presumptive Democratic nominee, we kind of slipped into a couple weeks of pretty familiar veep stakes, speculation about who the presidential candidate will pick as their running mate. And it feels kind of normal, right? Or normal-ish. All the various governors being floated, the scuttlebutt about who will provide an edge in what swing state. There's a pretty long history, actually, at least in modern history, of all of this. So much so that earlier this year, we did a special series on the veep stakes. In that series, by the way, I learned that the term veep stakes really took off in the mid 80s into the 90s. 1984 had a lot of speculation and 1992 may have been the most veep stakey of veep stakey elections. So we're going to run the first episode from that series again here, just in case you missed it or in case re-listening to it will help you frame this current news cycle in 2024. But I'll just tell you two things that I learned from that series that I've kind of been thinking about as I watch this mini Veep Stakes we're in right now play out. One, it is kind of shocking how not vetted so many of the vice presidential picks have been. Uh, inevitably, the nominee makes a pick and then a couple weeks later, news starts to trickle out about them. People dig up old stories and it's like, whoa, how did you not know this about the person that you just added to the ticket? In fact, there's all these stories about the presidential nominee kind of meeting the vice presidential pick for the first time, like right when they're about to make the decision or having like a couple phone calls and making this decision. It's kind of stunning how little vetting there actually is. And I think we're kind of seeing this play out a little bit right now on the J.D. Vance side. And it makes me curious what kind of vetting is going on on the Democratic side. Related to that, I've been thinking a lot about something that Nikki says in the episode that we're about to play, which is that this is really the first big test of a presidential candidate's leadership and management style. I've said this on the show a bunch, but running for president is so different from the job of actually being president. But selecting a VP does involve a lot of the kinds of things that I do think matter in terms of being a good president. Who do you trust? Who do you surround yourself with? How do you go through a process of making decisions? Ultimately, how do you find someone who will compliment you as you make the hard decisions that come with being the president? So I don't know if the VP pick itself makes a difference, but the process by which the selection is made is a nice indicator of the potential president's management style. And this is, in the end, a managerial position once you're out of the campaign and you're in the White House. So that's the way in which I think it matters. Oh, I said there were two things, but there's one last thing. I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't mention it. Listeners who heard the series know that we really did the series as an excuse to talk about one of my favorite stories in political history, and that's the cruise ship rides in Alaska where the GOP brain trust fell in love with Sarah Palin and eventually made her the 2008 vice presidential nominee. I just love that story. Please go track that episode down. It is such a perfect little moment in esoteric political history. But it does also relate to something that we are seeing play out here in 2024, which is that these VP picks, what you see is you see the brain trust of a party really fall in love with someone. And then a little bit later, everyone's like, wait a minute, what were they thinking? And again, J.D. Vance comes to mind. But I'm also watching on the Democratic side, all of these Democrats across the country fall head over heels for these random governors whose names they probably didn't even know like two weeks ago. And part of me wonders 
Let's see how this plays out. All right, that is enough for me. A few thoughts on this Veep Stakey moment. And here, again, is that episode that we recorded earlier this year. We will also put links to the other episodes and links to our live show in Boston on September 13th. All right, thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Hello, and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. And welcome to Veep Stakes Week, or Veep Week, or I don't know, we'll still workshop the name. We'll come up with something. (laughs) Veep Week is kind of fun to say, or annoying. We'll find out. Uh, But look, as you know, listeners, this is an election year here in the United States. And from time to time through this election season, we're going to do some of these special series. We're going to take a week or so, but a few episodes, and kind of try and track the typical rhythm of an election cycle. And yes, 2024 is anything but a typical election cycle, but it is still an election year. There are still lots of interesting election-related stories from the past that can kind of help us understand this moment. So if you recall, earlier this year, we did Hangers On Week, which is our look at various primary candidates who hang around in the nominating process. Later in the summer and into the fall, we're going to talk about the conventions and we're going to talk about advertising and we're going to talk about October surprises. But right now, we want to talk about this window where the primaries are over, the hangers on have maybe faded away a little bit. It's not quite time for the conventions or big policy debates. So something that often fills the void, especially in the last 30 or 40 years or so, is the so-called Veep Stakes, speculation over who will be the vice presidential pick of the presumptive nominee, endless debate over what kind of nominee would best serve the ticket, and whether a vice presidential pick really matters at all. So, welcome to Veep Stakes Week, our look at some notable vice presidential scuttlebutt. Here, as always, I'm trying to say the word scuttlebutt more on the show. Here, Good New Year's resolution. As always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. So we're going to do three parts here in Deep Stakes Week. Uh, Like we did last time, though, in this first episode, we kind of want to do a little bit of a survey, uh, lay out some big lessons that we feel like we've learned about how people go about selecting their vice presidential pick. And then we will talk about some people specifically. And don't worry, there is a Sarah Palin episode coming. (laughs) Uh, But I think it's worth laying out some kind of important facts about what Deep Stakes is and how it's played out. I mean, I suppose one thing to point out is it's a relatively modern phenomenon, right? Because it used to be, well, in general, a lot of this stuff got decided at conventions. This sort of Mm -hmm. long slog of a nominating process didn't really exist. And then often, you know, the vice presidential pick was the the person who came in second. I mean, sometimes sort of very formally, it was the person who came in second becomes vice president, which sometimes led to some awkward pairings. Or it was just sort of a norm that that would be the case. And I don't know, when do we want to pin it kind of becoming a more modern phenomenon and there would be this big speculation and it would be a big symbolic choice and it would say a lot about the candidate to who it would be that they would select as their vice president. I think a big turning point comes in uh, the Roosevelt administration. It comes with Franklin Roosevelt. Um, The presidency is changing a lot in the 20th century. The president himself is becoming a much more powerful figure. That is certainly the case under, under Roosevelt and is gaining power over the party, in part because presidents over the course of the 20th century are going to be selected more through voter primaries than by the party itself. Um, So when Roosevelt chooses Henry Wallace to run with in 1940, that's kind of when we start to think of this as the selection of the presidential nominee as opposed to the selection of the convention or the party. There are still going to be some exceptions going forward, yeah. but by and large, going forward from 1940, um, it's going to be the the nominee's choice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's worth also pointing out that in the past when you had less of that kind of sense of, well, this is up to the presidential nominee. This is they get to sort of be strategic and it's it's a sort of their one of their first big statements. You'd get these kind of random pairings that were mostly because of the way the conventions played out or because of um, the way the party would run things. And, you know, for instance, one in th- interesting thing worth pointing out is like Chester Arthur, who becomes a vice presidential nominee, his highest public position prior to that was the inspector of the port of New York. So sometimes, you know, when you had <laughs> an it important as job, sort of, Jody. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> I suppose so. Talk about uh, a promotion. Unless, <laughs> as we list some names, I think we will probably list some people who maybe had less qualifications Just one than that. Away. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. So to that point, Kelly, I mean, I think we, you know, we each want to go through, we each kind of have a sort of lesson that we feel like we want to lay out. And I will, I will start a little bit with a sort of overview 
question that I think hangs over all of this, which mm-hmm. is how much does a vice presidential pick actually matter? And I mean, I think mm. it's sort of cliche to say, like, it doesn't matter until it really matters. Right. And then, yeah. you know, you're a heartbeat away. But um, generally speaking, I think the vice president is sort of diminished, not thought of as a very significant role. What, what's the famous saying? I mean, it's like the ultimate understudy, right? Yeah. Like you're always sort of waiting for your moment to shine. But your reason for shining may never be uh, under... Um, Good circumstances. But I do like this analogy that um, Hubert Humphrey said in sort of describing like the role of the vice president. He said, once the election is over, the vice president's usefulness is over. He's like Mm. the second stage of a rocket. He's damn important going into orbit, but he's always thrown off to burn up in the atmosphere (laughs) afterwards. (laughs) Incredible. And I was like, wow. That's that's, amazing. That's kind of spot on. I mean, when you think about like the announcement of some of these vice presidents, there is a lot of buzz and excitement about, Mm -hmm. you know, who that person could be and how they might galvanize, you know, the rest of the the party. But then after the election is over, it's kind of like, I mean, there's not very much that the vice president does unless they need a tie-breaking vote or something like that. Well, with, and you know. Especially, you know, prior to the last 30 years or so, even yeah. that. I mean, we did an episode right about William Henry Harrison's death. Mm-hmm. And in there, we pointed out that there wasn't even kind of like a system on the books to say, oh, if the president dies, the vice president takes over. And I mean, even yeah. all the way up to LBJ, they didn't really codify that. And so mm-hmm. even that idea that like you're just waiting in case something goes wrong is a fairly yeah. modern sort of formal phenomenon, too. Well, and there's this idea that it's where careers go to die. I can't remember who (laughs) said it, but one of the people elevated to the vice presidency, Pint Agnew, said that um, the vice presidency is how you go from a potential unknown to an actual unknown. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like that's kind of true. Because you're no longer visible in any real way. Whatever job you take after is going to be seen as a demotion unless it's the presidency. Um, So that that can be complicated. I still remember... This was years ago. I think it was like Jay Leno or something like that or Jay Walking or whatever. And they were asking random people on the street who Al Gore was. They were showing his picture and people were like, they had no idea who he was. And I was like, oh, man, that's bad. It's rough. Um, So, you know, we'll go through all this stuff in terms of whether the vice presidency matters and whether the vice presidential pick matters. And I think it cuts both ways. It's like. Usually it's a non-factor until it's a factor, right? right. Um, yeah, we also had that um, episode recently about Truman resigning or Truman announcing he wouldn't run again. And we um, actually asked our listeners if anyone could could name the VP who would ostensibly fill his shoes. And it was this guy, Albin William Barkley. Uh, and actually a couple of listeners did write it and say, I knew that. So good for you, listeners. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, fairly obscure job. Um That said, you know, we'll get to this, but like think of someone like Joe Biden, right? I think Barack Obama, there was a strategy to that choice, too. Mm -hmm. But I think also part of that was an attempt by Obama to really reframe what the role of vice president is and end up being true. Uh, Nikki, you probably know better than I do. But, you know, actually sort of like Obama and Biden really did lean on each other. Mm -hmm. And um, the vice president in that case was someone who was genuinely kind of like helping the president day to day once they were in office. Right. And that doesn't start with Joe Biden. It was something that was part of the negotiations with Bill Clinton and Al Gore as well. Um, right. That Al Gore would have a real portfolio as vice president, and and he he does. I mean, we'll talk about Al Gore some more some other time. But um, I, I feel like that idea of giving the vice president something to do is an important one, especially if you want to pluck a rising star out of whatever position they hold. Mm-hmm. I also think it's worth noting that the vice presidential pick matters not just for the person being picked, but for the nominee. Right. Because the, it is seen by many people as the first test of how yeah. presidential mm-hmm. the person can act. Are you going to choose in the good of the country? Are you going to choose based on ideas of loyalty? Like what is governing mm-hmm. this choice and what can we glean about your leadership style from the decision you make in picking your running mate? Um, so there's a lot of sort of scribing and tea leaf reading when it comes mm-hmm. to somebody picking their vice presidential candidate. I mean, I actually, and that's what we're here to really talk about is the sort of selection of the vice president, not what the vice president actually does once they're in office. But I actually buy that argument, mm-hmm. and, and especially in the sense of, and I've mentioned this a bunch of times on the show, but you know, I think that there is a sort of disconnect between how we pick a president and the sort of things that someone needs to do to run the gauntlet of running for office versus what they actually do once they're in the job, you know? And I, th- I think yeah. there's often a big sort of disconnect there. Um, in this case, I actually think 
there is, you know, some substance in that, like, I think a big part of being a leader and a manager is surrounding yourself with good people and setting up, you know, uh, um, a brain trust. And this is like the big high profile place where I think you can actually read into the selection, I think, as an indicator of how someone thinks about leadership, though it is also, as we will see often, you know, very political and cynical and sometimes Uh like overthought and very strategic in that sense. And sometimes you can, um, but that is an indication of someone's um, leadership style too, is that they're willing to sort of cave to some of those more um, strategic or political um, impulses. Mm -hmm. So we have a few kind of rules that we feel like we want to lay out about picking a VP and they'll allow us to sort of name check some folks as we go. But um, Nikki, you have rule number one that we've developed here. Right. Rule number one is actually two related rules. Do your research and do no harm. And if you don't do the first one, the likelihood of doing the second (laughs) one goes way down. Um, if, If you haven't thoroughly vetted the person who you're going to pick, the odds that they are going to harm your ticket go way up. Um, and that's something that we saw in 1972 with the McGovern campaign. So listeners know a little bit about the McGovern campaign. Um, The Democratic Party had been pretty divided. The peace contingent within the Democratic Party had wanted a more liberal candidate in 1968. They didn't get it. And in 1972, they do. McGovern is this kind of grassroots, seen as very progressive candidate. But once he wins the nomination, he has to bring the party together. So he starts reaching out to people who, who he thinks can do that. Guess who the first person he reaches out to for his running mate is? This is the sign that something's going wrong. It's Ted Kennedy. Yeah. Which, fine. Mm. This is three years after Chappaquiddick. No. This is a man with baggage. <laughs> no. um, I, I get that he has the Kennedy name, but anyway, fortunately, I think Kennedy turns him down. Um, so do two other senators that he asks, Gaylord Nelson and Abe Ribicoff. Um, So he ultimately turns to this guy named Thomas Eagleton. So the reason that he turns to Eagleton, who's a senator from Missouri, and the reason that he turns to him is because Eagleton is seen as more moderate. He's Catholic. He's pro-life. And that's important because the press was running with the line on McGovern, a quote that they had gotten from an anonymous source, more on that in a sec, that he was the candidate of amnesty, acid, and abortion. Um, The actual quote was something like, um, McGovern is for amnesty, abortion, and legalization of pot. And that quote was given to the press by Thomas Eagleton. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come out until way, way later. But anyway, um, so Eagleton is sort of set up as the person who's going to ease that uh, that sort of label of being the pro-abortion ticket um, and try to bring more of, quote unquote, middle America to the McGovern ticket. And then, you know, to our lesson here about doing research, it kind of starts to go sideways. I mean, one interesting thing about the so-called Eagleton affair is that there really was very little vetting, right? And that's the mm. kind of watchword here. I f- this, is vetting used more in the picking of a, histo- of a vice presidential candidate more than any other context? I feel like it's just so affiliate- ass- associated with that now. I mean, now it is. It comes from horse racing. Right, um, right. Like mm. Which every, also, like every yeah, political... We conceptualize yeah. politics. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't say vetting for basically anything else, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. But also, but like, I, I think that vetting might be too strong of a word here. Oh yeah. When we say when we say vetting, there was a two minute phone call. Yeah. yeah. That's not enough time to verify that you have the right person on the other end of the phone. Yeah. Much less determine whether they should be your running mate. Anyway. So, what is it that goes wrong with Eagleton and what does it tell us about the kind of vetting process? I think we've done an Eagleton, you know, the Eagleton affair is a really fascinating mm-hmm. thing. I think that this says as much about the time as it does about Eagleton himself. Um, but mm-hmm. rumors start to circulate pretty quickly, which is a sign that this is already kind of known, that Eagleton had, quote, a complicated medical background. And his complicated medical background was that he suffered from depression. And the way that depression was often treated in this time was you would go into a hospital for nerves or fatigue. He experienced a couple of rounds of electric shock therapy, um, Mm. which uh, people had was pretty stigmatized. Um, And and mental health struggles were more stigmatized at the time as well, especially in politics. This idea that if you had a, a, a significant mental health history, that you were vulnerable to blackmail by the Soviets, um, that you were weak and therefore could be turned into a subversive. And so all of this was treated as though he had done something basically unforgivable. 
And for a little while, Eagleton and McGovern are like, we're going to we're going to stick with this. You know, this isn't a problem. We're we're a ticket united together. Um, but, you know, they could barely withstand it within maybe two and a half weeks. Um, Eagleton mm. was off the ticket. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Which, yeah, again, says a lot about the time. Um, but I think for our purposes, it also points out something that is a phenomenon here, which is, you know, you have to both think about your pick on its own terms and you have to think about how it will play. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, there was a misunderstanding of, oh, this is actually a scandal in the waiting. I mean, there was the lack of vetting, Mm. but also I think a sort of misunderstanding of how this would play if this stuff came out. So can I just add that? um, So Eagleson withdraws um, and the ultimate running mate for McGovern is, does anybody know off the top of their heads? No. It's no. Sergeant Shriver, huh. who is Eunice Kennedy's husband. Oh. Like, this guy could not get away from his love affair with the, the Kennedys. Guy. He was like, I got to get a Kennedy on this ticket. <laughs> Which, to be fair, is like I mean, how a lot of this logic goes. It's like, what yeah. would be the simplest? I just need yeah. a big, big splashy name. I need to like check this box or whatever. And I think the Kennedy box is a good mm. one to check sometimes. Um you want to say a word about Dan Quayle and if we're talking about vetting? <laughs> yeah. The one word I will say is potato. Potato. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah so, so Dan Quayle was chosen um, to be George H.W. Bush's running mate. Um, if you think about Biden as being the sort of father figure to Barack Obama, um, Quayle is the son figure to a more elderly George H.W. Bush. He's 41 years old. He was a senator, but he was chosen because... Bush was having trouble consolidating the conservative wing of his party. And Dan Quayle was that Indiana born culture right. warrior. Um, and so he was added to the ticket, but he brings a lot of issues. Um, his youth and inexperience are not big assets, um, yeah. especially on the debate stage. That famous You're No Jack Kennedy moment yeah. comes up uh, during the Quayle debates. <laughs> Um, I, he doesn't harm the ticket. I mean, Bush right. Well, wins one of the largest landslides yeah. in history. And that's just as much a lesson here as anything, right? You could pick a substandard vice presidential candidate and still win. And so what is, you know, what are we up to? The here? inconsequentialness nope. of it all. Let's move on to our, our second lesson here. And Nikki just kind of hinted at like Quail was picked a little bit for that regional balance mm-hmm. and that strategy and so forth. And that feels like a big part of it too, right, Kelly? It's like yeah. we have to be very strategic about filling in the gaps of what our presidential candidate brings to the table and what else is sort of missing, right? Absolutely. So balance, seeking balance is a big part of the ticket. And I feel like that balance breaks down in like three different ways. Region. Mm-hmm. Right, like you have mm-hmm. a southerner and a northerner, you have a west coaster and an east coaster, or something like that. Um, age is a really big thing if you have someone who's on the older side, maybe your VP's on the younger side, or vice versa. And then, like, ideological balance, meaning, like, well, we're hard left on this, so maybe we find someone who's more moderate on pro life or something like that. Mm-hmm. But you see this play out over and over again. I mean, I think of especially when it comes to like age, I think of like. Palin and McCain, I think, is a mm-hmm. good age. I think of, like, mm-hmm. you're always going to go sort of that younger route. You just mentioned, Nikki, like Dan Quayle and Bush. Same thing with um George Bush and Cheney. Cheney, you're going right. to pick an older statesman. You could say the same thing for Biden and Obama. You know, he's picking sort of like right. the senior totally. the senior senator, the, the one who's got more sort of like knowledge of, you know, foreign diplomacy, things of that nature. But then I also think that region is something that plays out too. Not all the time. I mean, if I think of like Clinton and Gore necessarily, Arkansas and Tennessee seem kind of like same. <laughs> but if you're thinking about it in terms of like, you know, having that North South connection, I think of the Kennedys and or I think mm-hmm. JFK and I think of LBJ as that perfect like we need Texas moment. Yeah. Um, I even go back to like, you know, the Civil War when I think about Lincoln and Johnson. Lincoln right. was very much like we need a Southerner and that ideological balance. We need someone that will you know, sort of assuage Southerners into thinking that I'm sympathetic. Um, Andrew Johnson was that pick. Now that can backfire 
especially right. if you get assassinated. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I think that there are all these different ways in which people are trying to find that balance so they feel like they sort of touch every corner going into the election. People want to make sure all of their bases are covered. And if they lean to East Coast or if they lean to young or if they lean to, you know, old white male, then it doesn't feel like anything is sort of progressive about their Mm -hmm. campaign. I feel like growing up, we were always taught that regional balance was the big way of picking your ticket. That that has seemed less important in recent years. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the idea that you're going to pick a person from a particular state and you're going to get that state and it's uh, many electoral votes, Mm -hmm. um, and you're also going to balance things out regionally. But there have been, you know, recently, Cheney comes from a three electoral vote state. Palin comes from a three electoral vote Mm -hmm. state. There's been a lot of talk of picking people from the same state, which you can't do constitutionally, but it's it's so much rooted now in uh, a, a different set of concerns other than regional balance it sometimes comes up. I mean, you see it in the John Edwards, John Kerry yeah. um, mm-hmm. pairing um, where Kerry was an effete Northeast liberal snob. Yeah. And so he put John Edwards on his ticket as a Southerner. Even that is not a lot of VPs actually don't necessarily bring their states along with them. So, well, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we're so polarized now that like we kind of know where, you know, 42 of the states are going to vote anyway. And so but, you know, if you could pick someone from one of those the, one of those states. Um, but, you know, I think of these kind of ways in which you seek balance, like regional, age and temperament and ideological. I mean, those first mm-hmm. two seem like they could work. I mean, so, uh, it was mm-hmm. worth saying, like in all of these, you know, sometimes people just see through it and they see it mm-hmm. as cynical and it doesn't work. But in general, I think like regional balance is a, is a worthy statement. It, it can mm-hmm. be seen as a worthy statement. You know, we want to be we want to speak to the whole country, and so if we're going to have a northerner or a southerner or whatever. Um, age and even temperament kind of makes sense to me, too. You know, like mm-hmm. we're going to work together, and I think we mm-hmm. want to have sort of diversity of perspectives. To me, you know, ideological recalibration or balance just feels like the place where there's – it just rings hollow to me. You know, it's like the yeah. point of electing someone is that they have an ideology and this sort of cynical say. They're like, well, I'm conservative on this. I'm going to get someone liberal on this. It just doesn't <laughs> – you know, no, it's a job. Well, what are you? What are you about? And so, you know, I think this also helps move us to the kind of third lesson that we want to lay out here in our first intro, which is like sometimes you don't always go for this kind of balance and trying to appease everyone. Sometimes this VP pick is about making, you know, a statement. Mm-hmm. And I think we've mentioned it a couple of times, but I just think it's really interesting to think about Clinton Gore, mm-hmm. where the VP pick there of Gore was basically like, let's find the person most similar to Clinton here, right? A young Southern red state Democrat. Um, mm-hmm. And we're just basically going to like double down on the message that we're trying to send. And I think that was a really effective statement. And I think that maybe if Clinton, funnily enough, as the like classic triangulator, if he'd try to find mm-hmm. someone to kind of balance him out in some way, maybe it wouldn't have been effective as saying, no, 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 this race is about kind of youth. And then we're going to, you know, and then all of a sudden there's going to be all these images of us jogging together contrasted Mm -hmm. with the very old um, H.W. Bush or whatever. So, you know, there's an interesting one where it's a sort of like very effective, quote unquote, statement pick. It's difficult to overstate just how big of a deal that was in 1992, because Mm -hmm. Clinton was coming in as potentially the youngest person ever to be elected to the presidency or very close to it. And so he was Mm -hmm. expected to pick a D.C. insider who was older and who could add gravitas to the ticket. And he said, no, we are the future looking generation. He was the first baby boom president. He would be if he were Mm -hmm. elected um, running against somebody who had fought in World War II. And he wanted to emphasize or underscore the message of his ticket. And that was, we are about tomorrow. We are about the future. We are about youth, all of these different things. And I think that his his pick of Gore, which was really surprising um, for a lot of people, uh, did that. It showed that he was going to be somebody who took risks um, as president. And he certainly did that in more than one way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. And then, (laughs) you know, contrast that to... Eight years later, in 2000, you have Gore uh, now running for president, and his Mm -hmm. vice presidential pick is Joe Lieberman, which I think was seen at at the time as very much a kind of like triangulation. I want to separate myself Mm -hmm. from Clinton. I'm going to pick someone who's more of an elder statesman, someone who, you know, 
eventually turned into a Republican, but, you know, someone who was critical of Clinton administration. I remember, you know, that was kind of the first election I was pretty aware of. And I mean, I think um, I remember a lot of criticism at the time. It's like, why are you running away in this sort of cynical Mm. seeming way? Why are you running away from the accomplishments of the eight years in office? Um, Another classic statement pick is Geraldine Ferraro, 1984. Mm -hmm. Um, First off, this is Mondale is the first to announce his running mate ahead of the convention and sort of Mm -hmm. turn this into What's the what's the word they use? They uh, eventize this, turn this into a moment, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, a huge moment because it's the first woman on a major party ticket, um, and so it really does make a splash. I mean, it opens up a sort of window before the convention, where then Ferraro, I think we can imagine the kind of criticism she gets mm-hmm. as a woman running for office in um, 1984. But it does open up this window <laughs> where she is being then she's in the spotlight, right? Yeah. But it allows people to imagine what is possible, right? Even even though, you know, yeah. they don't win. But it still allowed people to say, like, hmm, we have never considered a woman in this position before. What might that look like? What might that be? It also reminds us of the pressure put on a candidate in that position, because when mm. the ticket loses... It is quite a long time before another woman is chosen oh, yeah. as a running mate uh, on a major party. Because you picked a girl, like that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we can probably wrap up our sort of look at the basic lessons there. So to recap, some of the stuff we've sort of gone through here is you know you want to do some research, you want to do some vetting, uh, you want to maybe seek balance, but as long as it feels like authentic, I'd say, and then. There are times, and it's risky, but there are times when you can try and make a statement. And I think we will leave it there because our next episode (laughs) is going to talk about maybe the most statement of all statement picks. (laughs) We will indeed talk about Sarah Palin, how Sarah Palin was vetted and not vetted. And there will be trips to Alaska and cruise ships and (laughs) shrimp cocktail and lots more. Oh, yeah. So we come to an end of our first episode of Veep Stakes Week, but we will be back with two more as we continue with this special election year series. But Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to This Day in Esoteric Political History. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Our transcripts, which you can find on our website, are done by Kala Nakua. This Day is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. Audrey Martovich is executive producer. Yuri Lasordo is director of operations. If you want to support the show, tell a friend about this day and become a member of Radiotopia at whatever level works for you. You can do that at our website, thisdaypod.com. Also on our site, you can find transcripts, sign up for our newsletter, find links to follow us on Instagram and threads, buy merch like shirts and hats and phone cases, find information about our theme song, give feedback on an episode we've done, or suggest topics for a future episode, that and lots more, thisdaypod.com. My name is Jody Abergan. We'll see you soon. Radio Tokyo.